Burian Associates contract. If I could have a motion to add both of those. Daryl? And a second. Second. Okay. All right. And a vote, roll call vote. To approve. Aye. Lori, Daryl? Aye. Crystal? Aye. Okay, motion is passed. So Monty will be added and the beer Burian contract will be added. Okay, and then the agenda, approve the agenda. Question? Um, was there anybody here that was here to show up for the meeting that wished to speak? Um, that's that's mm -hmm. out of order. Oh, well, someone had contacted me that they wanted to be on the agenda. Yeah. And I was just wondering, I didn't know their faces, but I didn't. Um... You can make a motion if you want to. Are, are you, you wish to be on the agenda? Yeah. Um, so I wish to add the Bell Bell Levy to the agenda. Okay, is there a second? A second? Second. Okay, and. Who, who would be speaking? Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Ryan Ackerman, the administrator for the Service River Joint Board, and then David Ashley, our chair. I think we emailed you, didn't we? I've gotten some emails, yeah. yeah. I think we're going to let Monty answer your question. Okay. Oh, there's a motion and a second on the floor. Okay. Um, all in favor? Lori? Nay. Daryl? Aye. Aye. Austin? Tara. Aye. Okay. Motion passed. Should we, do you want to address that now? Sure. Why don't you? Yeah, I, I guess if you have, you, you're on the agenda, go ahead. I, okay. what, what I can say is that we've been communicating with, with your attorney. Right. And I received some materials from your attorney today. And maybe I could outline this for the board as to what the issue is before you speak. Um, so the, the district um, installed a new water line, and the district has received uh, all of the approvals necessary for the water line that, that has been installed. But there's an issue that um, the resource board has uh, raised with the water line going under their levee. And what I'm trying to understand is what, uh, what the regulatory environment that we're in to determine how to resolve the, 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 the conflict or the dispute that that has been raised. And frankly, it was my expectation that we would receive the materials from your attorney, we would have an opportunity to review them and then we would have a discussion about what it is that, that you're asking of the board. Um, but the, I guess the floor is yours. Well, Madam Chairman and Board Members, again, Ryan Ackerman, Board is the Administrator for the Service River Joint Board. Um, I guess I'm here today to just talk, talk about some concerns from our side. I think there's some misunderstanding, perhaps, and some miscommunication with regard to this issue. I'm not here to seek resolution to this issue today. You know, we've got our attorney engaged in this as well. He's going to be working with Monty on figuring out the logistics of all of this. But, I just think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of the concerns from our perspective. And I just wanted to be here to articulate those and to ask, answer your questions if you, if you have any. I mean, we recognize that flood control and rural water, these are two fantastic missions for the people of Northwest North Dakota. So we're not here to say that one is you know, better than the other, um, but that we have to work together to be able to fulfill both missions simultaneously. I think that's in the public interest, and I know you guys agree with that. So I just wanted to talk through uh, some issues from our, from our perspective here. Um, I'm not gonna go through the memo that we had developed. This was shared with um, North Prairie's engineer. And Wade. Thank, thank you, thank you, with, with Wade. A lot of this information was there's some additional stuff that's been updated within here as well, so uh, Monty can review this at, at his, at his uh, leisure. Um, but you know, fundamentally, we have some concerns with the safety of the levee 
following the directional drilling of a water line beneath that levee. Okay, so fundamentally, the concern is that when you directional drill a pipe, the drill head that you use is typically larger in diameter than the water line that you pull through that hole, right? So if it creates this annular space or this void between the hole that's drilled and the water line itself. That void creates what's called a preferential seepage path and is a big concern for us with regard to levee safety. In terms of the, you know, the permits that are required and stuff like that, the attorneys are going to go through that and determine you know, the regulatory framework for exactly what is necessary in all this stuff. But from our perspective, we believe that there are three different permissions or permits that are required for this. Number one would be a section 408 permit from the Army Corps of Engineers. Number two would be the local floodplain development permit, which would be issued you know, likely by the city of Elva and perhaps McHenry County. And then the third would potentially be a conditional letter of map revision from FEMA. And the reason why this comes into play is because the installation crosses a congressionally authorized flood protection levy that was built by the Corps of Engineers and shows up on the national, uh, uh, as a part of the National Flood Insurance Program's flood insurance rate maps. Okay, so on these FEMA maps, this levy system is recognized and it gives credit to the, to the citizens that are behind that so that they don't have to purchase the high risk, high cost flood insurance. Okay, so it removes that purchase requirement. So any time that any type of activity could render that system ineffective, FEMA can potentially de-accredit that levy, and it places all the residents behind that levy back into that regulatory floodplain, and they're required to purchase that flood insurance if they have any type of federally backed mortgage uh, or, or debt instrument on that property. So, you know, there's a couple of concerns. There's the safety concern, and then there's this FEMA flood insurance concern, right? From our perspective, we haven't gotten through these processes yet. Uh, we, we, I think first and foremost, we want to address the, the safety issue that is with this installation. We think there's a way to do it. Um, we'd love to have that conversation, productive conversation with your engineers about how this should be done. Um, but fundamentally, you know, the, the, the process is broken here because we discovered this issue when somebody from our office saw a directional drill rig sitting in the ditch at Highway 52 at Velva drilling a water line underneath the levee. So we had no idea that this was going to be happening. And somehow, some way, the appropriate entities need to be notified. Now there was a permitting process that was followed for this, including getting local floodplain development permits from the city and McHenry County. But the real problem is that the maps that were used to get those permits are different than what was actually installed. So the let me say that again. The maps that were used to get the permits did not show a water line going underneath the levee. So this issue would never pop up in a permit review um, with that being shown. So you know, during the design process, I understand that things change, but the permits and the solicitation of use from agencies needs to be redone when the scope changes such that it has an effect on the resources that another agency is responsible for overseeing. So, you know, uh, there's a lot more detail within the memo here. I'm not going to, you know, I'll, I'll leave it for you to consider, but um, I know there was some dialogue about this at your last board meeting, and I, I just I make myself available to, to answer your questions if you have any. Um, Would you be willing to come back and we can have our engineer here? Yeah, of course. So I mean, I think that what makes sense to me is, is you know, so my getting involved in this uh, was it was raised as an issue, and of course, what I'm trying to determine is, is this a legal issue? Is it a good neighbor issue? Is it a regulatory issue? Like, what's the, the regulatory or legal environment that we're in, yeah. so I can determine what the nature of, of the conflict is, so I can advise the board as to what their legal rights are, which might be different than how this this gets resolved. And um, so I've been communicating with your attorney about that, about saying, hey, send, send me something that I can understand exactly what, what you just were saying about this is a FEMA, FEMA issue so I can understand what that issue is. Because it's, I think there's a fundamental disagreement between your engineer and 
our engineer as to whether this water line uh, is a safety risk. Right? That, that's what my understanding is. Now, I'm not an engineer, so I can't answer that question as to which of the engineers is correct. And of course, that's probably going to drive what the district um, decides to do is how we're going to resolve that, that question. And we should be able to, to get to a, a, a reasonable accommodation as to that issue. Yeah, I, I, and I guess Mr. Uh, Rodby? Rodby, yeah. Back, 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 right. um, and, and board members, um, yeah, our, our intent is not to go, honestly to go down a legal road with this. I mean, these are two entities, North Prairie and the Service River Joint, three entities, North Prairie, Service River Joint Board and City of Elva. We're, gonna, we're all gonna be here a long time, right? And we all wanna be good neighbors. We certainly don't want this situation to happen again because it's in our all collective best interest to figure out how to navigate through these issues. Um, you know, I guess if there's, a, if there's a disagreement on the technical merits of this, I, you know, if North Prairie's engineer is going to sign off on this, saying that this meets levy safety requirements, I have yet to see that certification, although I've asked for it, okay? Because I know that it can't be done with the installation as it sits today. We're, we're looking at this through two separate lenses. I'm not going to pretend to look at it through the lens of what's best from a water supply perspective. That's, that's not our arena to get in here with. But I will weigh in on what's best from a flood protection perspective. And fundamentally, the insulation that's there increases the risk to the citizens of Alba. And that's ultimately, I, I know that's not acceptable to you guys. It's certainly not acceptable to us or to the city of Alba. So can let's just work together on a... Is the question. Uh, I'm sorry? Can that risk be quantified? Can it be quantified? Well, right, I sure. assume putting sure. any, any infrastructure under the levy increases the risk to the levy, right? It, it certainly does. So it there's an does. acceptable amount of risk and there's an unacceptable amount of risk. Right. And, and what we're talking about is not whether there's risk, we're talking about whether the risk is was is within the acceptable range, which my understanding is the Army Corps has signed off on this, and the Army Corps believes that this risk is acceptable. Do I have that correct? No, you don't, sir. Okay. Well, did the Army Corps issue the 404 permit, didn't it? The uh, Army Corps did not issue a permit. The Army Corps did state in an email that no four, section 408 permission wasn't required, how, which quite frankly is a mistake on their part. Okay. And we've had dialogue with them too, and now that they understand the full scope of what was done in terms of this waterline installation and also the abandonment of, I think, three water lines underneath the levee, they, they're not happy about this either. So and will you share that communication with us? Because that again, what you're telling me is different. That's right. What the, that's why I went in. Yep. Again, my plan for this was to have this meeting after we had your material, and our sure. engineer was here, so we could have this conversation once and not conversation now, and a conversation now with with after we get the material and we have our engineer here. But yep. what you're telling me is different from what the engineer, what our engineer is telling us, right? What the engineer is telling us is that. This isn't an Army Corps issue, not a FEMA issue, it's a your engineer issue. And, and again, I don't know how to sort that out, but sure. we need to sort that out, right? Yeah, and, and I think the, what I understood to be Teresa's thought on this, and Teresa, correct me where I'm off here, but there was a desire to pull in a third party regulatory agency to serve as an arbiter on this? No, that was yeah. not what I said. Okay. I said to Jason, I said, I, <coughs> I said, again, North Korea does not, not want to be a good neighbor, and we all have to play in the same arena, right, for many years to come. Um, but all entities have to get around the table, but I have, we have to see what all of you have, have. So when I talked to Jason, I said, I, get, I got the information that you put underneath the uh, uh, oh, uh, how you get over by the, the riverbed, right? Over, you guys sent me mapping of how you how you had to go under the riverbed over by Roosevelt Park, where the zoo is. And I get all of that. Um, and that being said, we all talk about levees here. I get why you did what you did there. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a specialist. But let's talk about the levee. And, and I, I think that's the part nobody really understands. Because when I talked to members of your board, they thought it was along the river. 
is not on the river levee. It's far from the river levee. It is on the south side of Highway 252 by Brandry Electric. So what you did at Roosevelt when you crossed the river and you did it a certain way, I so get that, right? Because you know as well as I know when the water's turning and you got flood, whatever, it's going to churn up your bank and I can understand that. But we're talking the south side of the highway, the water that would be in there would be standing water, so it's not going to be churning water up against a levee that's put there. I mean, I think everybody should see the picture first so you can understand where we're talking. And, and in visiting with some of the members of your board, they thought it was along the river too. And I said, it's not on the I said, it's not even on that side of the river. So again, that's where things kind of get construed for me. Um, but again, and I've always stated this, if we can all get around the table and get all our facts straight. And if you can give me the entities, that show what the core is going to say. They're going to tell us we've got to change it. It's not right. If you can get FEMA to say, you have to fix this, then I think it's a no-brainer. We have to fix it. And I don't think we're there yet, Ryan. I'm not trying to be difficult, but I don't think we're there yet. And when we're there, we'll have to do what is the right thing to do at that time. That's all I say. But we definitely want to let Monty finish doing his research. Because yep. there's right. more to it than, you know what I mean, we got it. So, so we will have to have another conversation. Yeah, I, I, was, I don't think we were expecting, you know, final resolution of the issue here today, but I, I think there's been, there's been a communication gap between our concerns and, and the board, right? And, uh, you know, Teresa just alluded to, to, to one of them, and I tried to address up front, and I, I obviously wasn't effective at, at getting it across, but the concern isn't with churning water. The concern isn't with superficial erosion that churning water creates. The concern is underground and preferential seepage paths that are created by directional, by directional drilling underneath the levee. So we're, we're, still, we're still disconnected with regard to what the concern is. Um, and and, and, I, and I, I think it'd be great. I think it'd be great to get on the table to, to talk about it. I think that's. I think that is a logical. Right, but if the concern is effective communication, you don't show up the day of the meeting, ask to be put on the agenda, provide us with material, and then have your lawyer email me material on the day of the meeting. Right, that's not how you do effective communication. You do effective communication by communicating ahead of time that you want to be put on the agenda so that we can have our engineer here and we can understand from your attorney what he's saying and we can have an intelligent conversation. Yep. So I mean, I, 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 I'm glad that you're here, but the method that you've chosen when you reached out uh, to us, I don't know, three weeks ago? And the answer was, have your lawyer contact us with what the issues are so that we can do this in a, in a reasonable, logical way and you ignored the request. So again, we're, we're going to have the conversation, but I, I don't think that it's legitimate for you to come here today and say you're interested in effective communication when you've chosen to, to, to behave in this way, which is not respectful to this board. I, I, I apologize if I've been disrespectful to anybody here. That's never my intent. I don't want to come across that way. So please accept my, my apology. Um, you know, with regard to trying to get on, you know, the agenda, we made that request several weeks ago, and and we're not given a response, yes or no. We're basically just told, Jack, our, our attorney Jack, is going to be working with Monty on this issue, and and okay, fine. And that he uh, wanted to research. I, I communicate, communicated pretty clearly what what the process that the board wanted to follow yeah. was, and nobody followed up with me to say, hey, can we have a conversation about sure. that process? Sure, and, and I guess just to, I mean, the, the insinuation that we like pop here and like throw this on the board in a very disrespectful way, I, I think that's pretty disingenuous to say that because we've been de dealing with this issue for almost two years. Almost two years. I understand. So you have to understand from our perspective, when you beat your head against a wall, 
with zero results, zero acknowledgement of the problem. I mean, that's we, not, we, that's we have true. to. We acknowledge, we acknowledge the issue. We communicated. I had a phone conversation with your attorney about this matter. Do you know that? Yes. Okay. So it's not that there, there's no response, right? I just was made aware of this right before the last meeting. I had a conversation with your attorney. We've emailed with your attorney. We've designed a process to do this in an orderly fashion. So I understand that you might be frustrated, but this isn't a situation where no one's responding to you. Madam Chair? Yes. Once again, thank you for allowing our opportunity to come before you. Uh, what Ryan said is actually true. We've been trying to reach out to you. And yes, we will have our attorneys discussing this matter in depth whether it has to go legal or not. Our goal was not to go that way. I thought we could do it interagency. In reviewing your discussion after your last meeting, there was a significant number of misinformation that you folks have been receiving. And I thought that a board of this magnitude needs to know the facts. And if you want to have a discussion about whose engineer is right, whose engineer is wrong, what's the magnitude of the problem, yes, you can. But the facts of how this proceeded needs to be known by you folks. And I thought it was very unfair to you folks after hearing your discussions of what you've heard and what you thought was going on. I thought it was important that you folks hear the facts of what's going on out there. And it is a very serious situation. It is very serious. I can't express the magnitude of it. We would not be here if it was some minor thing. This is major to do. And I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the board, and I hope we have an opportunity in the future. Thank you. All right, then we are going to, uh, Crystal? Um, I just have a question to clarify on this preferential seepage path. Um, is there any way to detect when something, if there's a failure underneath, it would feel like if, if it's underground? Like, what happens in the case of, what, what could happen? So the, um, the scenario that we're most concerned about would be one in which the soil becomes pressurized because of water on the wet side of the levee. It pressurizes the soil underneath it. Water seeps into this space between the pipe and the borehole. And then it surfaces somewhere on the dry side of the levee, on the protected side, right? I want to be clear, like, we're not concerned about seeing a little bit of water there on, on the dry side of the levee. What we would be concerned about would be actual levee foundation material, soil, moving through there because of gradients within the soil. You start to move that foundation material, ultimately the failure that happens is one that can happen very, very quickly. And it's one in which basically the levee just kind of falls into a hole. Um, and for the most part, you have no warning of this. That's one of the real criticals. This could be a silent killer, bottom line, because you don't know what's going on underneath ground. Turbulent water on top, you see that? Oh my gosh, we've got a levee break. Let's get the helicopters in, sandbags, whatever. Plug it up. This just is silent. All of a sudden it's 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 pre-saturated, the soil's underneath, and you get pressure on the, on the wet side, it comes through, and it's out. Gone. You have no time. And then do you have um, an idea for how to, like, what's the best, in your opinion, what is the best way to solve this? In, in, in my opinion, the best way to solve it is excavate down to the pipe, excavate underneath the pipe, maybe by two feet or so, while supporting the pipe so you don't lose service. Uh, backfill that with some sort of a flowable fill. You know, something where we're, we're not going to have any voids around the pipe. And then backfill with clay. Backfill with the levee material that we took out on top of it. Like, honestly, that that would be very likely an acceptable fix. However, you know, this this does need to be evaluated. Um, you know, through kind of the, the risk lenses, if you will, to see if you know. For example, like if you look at the water line that goes throughout your your whole system, we would want the water line to fail in some place other than underneath the levee, right? Because that particular 
risk is uh, something that can be catastrophic as well. So we'd want to make sure that the pipe, you know, may be weaker on either side of the levee to kind of have that failure occur outside of that levee prism. In areas where that's not practical, another thing that we've done is we've actually cased that water line pipe in a steel pipe. That way if the water line does burst underneath the levee, the water actually comes through the casing pipe on either side and then would surface away from the levee itself. So there's different ways that this can be addressed. But again, that, that initial you know, thought that I gave about excavating global fill underneath there, I mean, this, isn't a, this is not a very extensive project. I wanted to be clear about that. But you know, the, other, the other thing that we do have to address are, are these pipes that have been abandoned. We don't know how they were abandoned and if they represent a significant risk or not. But these are just those things that we have to go through, that, that we have to go through regularly. Like we're, we're used to this stuff, right? But I understand, you know, in the context of rural water, you're not encountering this very frequently, right? So um, we, we want to be a partner in terms of how to like address this issue, but fundamentally there, there's a concern here and I think we want to work to figure out how to resolve it. So we want, we want Monty to, to finish researching so that we can have that productive conversation. <coughs> right now, we've got one side and we need to know all the rest of it, sure. okay? Thank you both for being here and Monty will be in touch, okay? Thank you. Yes. All right, let's, um, to the agenda, um, we need a motion to approve our meeting minutes from the last meeting. <coughs> Tara made a motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Okay, Daryl seconded. All right, roll call vote. Lori? Aye. Daryl? Aye. Crystal? Aye. Austin? Aye. Tara? Aye. All right, motion passes. Um, a motion to approve the financials. Okay, Lori made a motion to approve them. Is there a second? I'll second. Daryl? Discussion. Was I able to get any of my questions answered from two meetings ago? Regarding board expenses and employee expenses? Um, is that your is that part of your open record request? Well I had asked for it at two meetings ago. And you told me that you would get them to me. And you, you, before I was said, I need to ask your questions. Ahead. They, I was told to ask questions ahead of time. So I did, but I still didn't get them asked at the last meeting, or, or answered at the last meeting. Do you want to so in I'm still waiting for those. And I, I asked for the records because I asked for it on the board too. What, what records are you referencing? Is it the reference that you're seeking? Is An it itemization it? of what's included under the title board expenses. So the, the information that's used to create the financial report, I want to see that information. I don't want to just see the summary, I want to see what's inside the details. Right. So the, you, you've got the copy of the letter on your open records request on that material. <laughs> Yeah, I received an email from them. Okay, and and that, is that the records that you're talking about? Yes. Okay. So I, I, I mean, I just want to understand, right? And so I, when we get to the part of the agenda to talk about the records request, um, I will be discussing that. But, but we, we understood that as being an open records request, and the, the, the uh, district has responded to that, that the district is not required to create records that don't exist as part of an open records request. Well, it, it does exist because it was used to create this information. These numbers had to come from somewhere. So I want to know where, I want to know the numbers. I want to know the data behind the numbers. So however I have to do to ask, however it takes, whatever wording I need to use, I think everybody knows what I'm looking for. I want to know, I want to see an itemization of what's under Employee expenses. Okay, so is it a dollar ninety nine Apple dot com bill? Is it who hot? Um, or eating at ground round? Where, where are those expenses accounted for in our budget? Or are they included under meter replacement? Or what's under meter replacement? I, but I can't even get a very simple response of what is 
under board expenses and what's under employee expenses. This isn't hard. So do you want to do this now or do you want to? No, let's do the approval. Of the okay, all right. So let's do a roll call vote. Um, Lori? Aye. Daryl? Aye. Crystal? No. Austin? Aye. Tara? Aye. All right. Financials are passed. Old business. Um, we're going to put Monty here. So we added him to the agenda. Okay, so a couple of things and that I wanted to be on the agenda. Um, the first, I guess, is that we should reconsider the scope of my representation and the Boulder Law Firm's representation of the district. So my understanding is the district had reached out to my uh, law partner, Tammy Norgard, about providing legal services to the district. Um, the district signed a retainer agreement, and since then I have been providing general legal advice to the district. So what that means is, is that as part of the operations of the district, if there are legal questions about contracts, the recent purchase of the real property, um, the open records requests, the open meetings issues, um, coming to the board meetings, right? Any, basically anything that the district needs for purposes of legal services. Um, my understanding is that is within what the board approved of. Um, but I did get an email from Director Hendrickson um, where it's her understanding that, that my representation is limited to uh, governing documents and not providing general representation to the district. And so I thought the best way to address that was just bring it to the board and and my understanding and based on my review of everything is that you've hired me and my law firm to provide general legal services to the board, but to the extent that the board wanted to make a change to that understanding that now would be the time to, to clarify what my role is. I'm happy to do as much or as little as, as what the board, board wants me to do, but my understanding that I've been working under is that you've retained uh, me and my law firm to provide general legal services to, to the district. And that's correct. Okay. All right. So that, I just, like I said, I, th I think the best way of handling that is just to bring it to the board and see, see if, if, if our understanding is the same. Um, the second issue that I wanted to have a conversation with the board about, and I'm not 100% certain what the resolution is, and um, but it has to do with um, Director Hendrickson's uh, open record requests. Um, as I've indicated in several of the emails that I have sent, the legal issues raised by D Director Hendrickson and the open records requests and her communications with the North Dakota Attorney General's Office concerning the board is um, generating a significant amount of work for the general manager and for me as your counsel. And as I indicated in, in the email that I uh, sent to Director Hendrickson and to the board, um, the amount of legal services that are being consumed by this district is very disproportionate to the business of this district. And almost all of the disproportionate work that I'm doing is related to Director Hendrickson and her open records requests and communications with the North Dakota Attorney General's Office. And so uh, I understand that what I'm doing for you is disproportionate and the costs um, are significant because of that. What I want to say is that, that the open records issues are not binary. They're not yes or no, give the record, not give the record. Um, each request that comes in has to be analyzed uh, under the North Dakota Open Records Law as to whether it's an open record or not an open record. And the board is, is legally bound to provide uh, to any citizen who requests them any record that's open, but they're also legally bound not to disclose information which is confidential under North Dakota law. And then there's a, a spot in the middle where some records are exempt, which means they're not open records, but the board has the authority to release them if the board decides. And it's not uh, uh, the general manager and I who decide those issues. That we would have to come to the board and say, this is an exempt record, uh, should, should it be disclosed? Um, so what's causing the expense is, part of it is the, is the number of open records requests and the, the information that's being requested. 
part of it is then when an answer is given, Director Hendrickson is going to the Attorney General's office, and then the Attorney General's office is contacting me, and then I'm communicating with the Attorney General's office to try to resolve those disputes. And just by way of example, I was on the phone with the attorney from the Attorney General's office for about an hour earlier this week, trying to resolve the issue that you got the opinion on concerning the financial records that Director Hendrickson asked for and how to interpret North Dakota law as to, as to those. Um, and we're still reviewing another issue which involves the, the, the Verizon phone bills and, and my office hopefully will have an opinion on that um, here shortly. But, but what I want to tell you is that, is that sometimes it, the, the request for a record from a citizen is a simple matter and those records are given immediately. Sometimes a request is a more complicated legal matter because we want to get it right. We want to give the records when they're open and we want to not give confidential information. But we have to look at each request when it comes in. Um, and that, that, like I said, is creating significant um, expense for the district. When you say significant, like? I would say three or four thousand dollars a month of expense. Um, or more. Um, and I'll give you, a, you know, an example is that, again, this isn't an open records request, but there was an issue with whether or not the district's bylaws were properly adopted at the annual meeting in 2021. Two prior attorneys looked at this and had given kind of informal decisions or opinions that the bylaws were, act, were, were valid. But then there was, Dr. Henderson asked, challenged it, asked for another decision, and so I reviewed that, um, and I think that that review was probably between $3,500 and $4,000 of time to review all the materials and issue a decision, and my understanding is that Director Hendrickson has asked the Attorney General's office to review that. I don't know if that's correct or not, but it's a conversation I had with the Attorney General's office. Um, again, this is, this is a legitimate question, but if you want a legal answer, then there's a legal expense, right? So that, I mean, I don't know how to handle the open records law. You're under a duty to respond to each open records request, and we will continue to process those. Um, and again, I, I'm 100% in favor of the of transparency in the board um, and the district providing access to the public to the records that are open by law. Um, what I am trying to avoid is that there, some of these requests require the district to manipulate software, for instance. And, and if it's just Director Hendrickson asking the question, then it's only one person. But what happens when five or six people come in and they all want the district employees to manipulate the accounting software to produce reports, right? At some point, the staff time that is being taken up on this stuff becomes problematic and we can't treat an open records request from De Director Hendrickson one way and this open records request from somebody else a different way. Okay, so that that's on, just, just one second, that's on the open records part of it and that is a matter of, of um, law and there's nothing you can do about that except keep processing each record when it comes in and hopefully as we get through some of these issues, we won't have to revisit the legal research involved and in, in how they're resolved. That's more by, by way of information. The other issue that, that is raised has to do with um, Director Hendrickson being a, a director on the board. And she is correct that as a director on the board, the, the law allows directors to have access, which isn't necessarily a copy of a record, but access to information that might not be an open record. And we need to work our way through that um, because that's the other part of the conversation that I've had with the Attorney General's office. And the board has a set of policies about how directors gain access. And, and so we have to have a conversation about whether that policy is being followed. And within that policy, the board also has the ability to remove a director's access if the director's um, requests are impeding the, the operation of the district. 
I'm concerned from a legal standpoint about Director Hendrickson having access to, to confidential records given her public Facebook page. And I'll tell you why. We, my office does a lot of advising of um, school boards and other public entities. And as part of that, we recommend that members of school boards and directors not have public Facebook pages related to their board positions. Why? Because the United States Supreme Court has said that if you are on a board or a commission and you have a public social media page, you can create liability for yourself and you can create liability for the public entity because your Facebook page becomes an arm of the entity. And if you do things like remove comments or block people, it's treated as if the entity is removing comments and blocking people. And then the entity gets sued for a civil rights violation or the entity and the director gets sued for civil rights violation. And so I'm concerned about access to confidential information and then it ending up on a Facebook page of, of a director where then it seems like that is the official policy of, of the board. Now on the other hand, Director Hendrickson has a complete constitutional right to free speech and to maintain a social media presence. And so there's some tension here between these things and we're going to have to sort that out, but point. Legal resources, right? We've got to sort this out. We've got to figure out how we're going to advise Director Hendrickson or how the district is going to direct Director Hendrickson concerning her Facebook page to not create liability for the district and how we're going to handle confidential information if it's given to Director Hendrickson and then so that doesn't end up on a public Facebook page because that is the same then as the district potentially publishing it. Um, so what, I, what I'd like to do, and I wanted to get direction from the board, is I'd like to come uh, at the main meeting with some recommendations about how we're going to sort this out and how we're going to resolve this tension between Director Hendrickson's position as a director and her ability to access records which are not open. And um, you know maybe that will solve some of the issues with the open records uh, expense is to direct some of these maybe into an alternate policy or a different position. Um, so anyway, I wanted to raise that and, and, and if it's acceptable to the board, that's what I would do is I would come back at the main meeting with some, with some recommendations on, on these issues. Well, we, have, uh, we haven't gotten an invoice from you for quite a while, and I noticed that it hasn't shown up on um, the latest okay. reports. Okay, out of order. Right. You've done nothing but talk about me for 10 minutes. I think I can ask a question, and you're talking about the expense of the lawyer. Right. I would like to see your invoices. Why have we not received any more invoices? I have forwarded your request to the district. The district will provide a response for my invoices. Can we have a motion? Can I have another one? Um, I want, if, if it's too much to create a, create a record, just provide me the whole QuickBook entries, all the QuickBook, QuickBook entries for the month. That's not a special report, that's like export to Excel. Yeah. Just export to Excel, this is not creating a new record. And the, the, the law is very clear that creating it, taking it from the digital format to give it to someone is not creating a new record. So. I think you and I disagree about, uh, for, for, first of all, I understand you want access to the data that you don't have. And I think the way to handle that is through you being a board member and if that, if that is going to be provided, I think that would be the, the, the route to do it rather than through what you're describing, which is the open records process. And I'll tell you why. The, the, the way that I understand the open records law when it comes to electronically stored information is, and I'll, let's use the, let's use a, a bill that comes as a PDF, okay? If a bill comes as a PDF and the district doesn't make a, doesn't make a hard copy of it, but just simply saves the file in the computer. If you make an open records request, there is no record. There's a file in the computer. And so what the law says is the district has an opportunity 
has an obligation to give you that file. But if that PDF has confidential information on it that has to be redacted, traditionally the only way that would be done, it, now you can do it with software, but when the open records, it's part of the open records law was written, you couldn't. You'd have to print the document and then take a marker and redact the parts that, that are confidential. And so the legislature changed the law to say that, that electronic information is different, that, that, that the act of printing the document is not creating a record. So, but what you're asking for is not for the district to go into its records and give you a file. Let's use it more generically, not you. When somebody comes to the, the district and asks for the kind of accounting information where, where they want specific itemization, what they're really asking to do is to compile information that's being held electronically. And what that requires is someone has got to log into a computer, open a piece of software, run queries in the software to manipulate the data, and produce a report. Now that doesn't sound like that's a big deal until you get 10 of those a week, right? And so that's, that's why I'm trying to draw a hard line for the district, right? Actually, this is very simple. I just want what is sent to the accounting firm. Right. Just send me that. That's what I want. So it's already been compiled. It is a record, and it's already sent to them for them to put this report together. Again, the way to distinguish this is between what is an open record, which we would have to give to you and to anybody else who comes in and the processes we have to go through, and trying to find a way to accommodate what you'd like to look at as a director. And I would prefer that we focus on how to accommodate what you what you want to look at as a director. And that would be subject to the policy of the board and the supervision of the board. But I don't think it's prudent of me to issue a, a, an opinion on the open record side that's contrary to my understanding of what the law is. And what you're asking for is not a record. You're asking the board to either give you its raw accounting data or to create a record for you. And I don't think that that's something that is within the bounds of the open records law. I'll take the raw data. Well, I understand that, but I don't know that that's within the bounds of the open records law. And I mean, if you want to, I mean, again, you can make whatever open records requests you want, right? I'm not saying that you can't, but each time you do that, the general manager contacts me, my office then has to figure out, are you within the bounds of the open records law, or are you not? And it might seem like that's a simple matter for you, but I can tell you that it's not a simple matter, and it requires a legal analysis and legal research and conversations with the Attorney General's office on these issues. And we have to get the law right, right? That's, we have to do it the right way. And so I guess if you want to make an open records request for all the raw data, I'll go look at it. I don't know off the top of my head what the answer is, but if you want to make an open records request for that, then I think you should do that. But what I want to explain to the board is every time there's an open records request, Teresa sends it to me. Well, first of all, a lot of them I think she just answers. The ones that she's not sure of, she sends to me. If we can resolve it in a phone call, we resolve it in a phone call. If it's something where there's, I think there's more to it, I look at it or I assign it to one of the lawyers in my firm who does open records work, and he looks at it. And then we go off and do the research, and we come back with an opinion. But that, it's, for some of the things you're asking for, it's not as simple as me just saying, yeah, give her the record. It's, I gotta go look it up. I gotta go figure out whether the record, uh, what, what the record is. And, and sometimes that involves talking with the Attorney General's office. When I can tell you, I talk to the Attorney General's office and I say, what do you think? And, and they don't always know what the answer is either, right? So this is, what I'm trying to explain is that this is a complicated system that you're interacting with. And um, that's fine. You have the right to do that, but each time you do that, there's an expense to the district, and there's no way around the expense. As long as you're making the request, there's no way around the expense. Some lawyer's going to have to, if it's not me, some other lawyer is going to have to look at these um, to make sure that the law is being complied with. Can we have a motion for Monty to bring recommendations on how to better deal with this for our main meeting? I so Daryl, is there a second? Daryl? 
Okay, roll call vote. I just want to rewind a little bit so I know how to word that for the minutes. The motion. The motion. Yep. Um, a motion for Monty to, to bring recommendations to um, obviously the demonstration the last 20 minutes um, to better handle this. Okay. I would say that to, to, to address <coughs> uh, Director Henderson's access to information as a director. I mean, I think yeah. that's what the issue that, that I like. I mean, I like to steer it in that direction. I agree. Okay, roll call vote, Lori? Aye. Daryl? Aye. Crystal? No. Austin? Aye. Tara? Aye. All right, motion passes. So we will have that on our May agenda. Um, was there anything else, Monty, you wanted to address? No, nope, those were the things that came up this week. Okay. Um, we have the Burian contract. Yeah, um, I just got these. And um, I had asked, you're all aware of Sarah and the asset management program that she put together for us. <clears throat> and um, she's got that all put together. We've already dealt with that part. But it's a complicated little piece of software. So it doesn't do us any good to have the program if we don't use it and, and know how to, yep, to get the information in. So I asked her to put together a um, comprehensive planning model training on an on-call assistance. So she's, she's going to show myself, she's going to show my office manager and she's going to show the operations manager so there'll be three of us and she's going to train us on how to and how it works and then in here you will see and I've got some for you to pass it out I guess so everybody can see there should be um, um, six seven pages and you'll see how she got where she got oh hold on Sorry, I should have had a mistake for one, I apologize. I'm not against one of you. <laughs> they just made not one. Mm -hmm. They didn't make them all together. I, yeah, I've got my two. Oh. Yeah. This page three. Just in case you're wondering, you know, we've always talked about this before. But I'll reiterate it again. What this program does for us is, is it has all our assets in there. It tells us when they're going to come up. You put in when you do any improvements, when you put in new pipe, then it comes off of it's still an asset, but then it comes off of when it has to be replaced, and then you extend it out to when it has to be replaced. And the State Water Commission or Department of Water Resources, as they're called now, when you apply for funding or whatever, every they are asking districts what kind of asset management do you have, where's your where's your program at? It doesn't it didn't, you know that's one of the reasons why we have this too, because it's all black and white. You know, we can say here's what we're doing, here's how much money we set aside, you know, for or asset replacement. Oh it's and yeah. oh, this right here is just Exactly what I said. It's a comprehensive planning model training on on-call assistance and the dollar amount that it would cost for her to provide this to us. I apologize. I, I thought they could run this. And Here, thank you. Is that, that's yours. I, I don't need it. I got it. Um, okay. Yeah, then we got I got six pages. And then the only page the, the main page would be your second page, your two or three page. Second. Okay. Look at your second page. That's the that's the important. Okay. There's three pages of the contract, but behind it it shows how she got what she got. It's the explanation of the rates. Okay. Here. Yeah, these are all page two or three. 
I don't have three. You want to do And Austin needs three of three. Hadn't we, didn't we pay her like $12,000 earlier this year? Or yeah, something that's when she updated the model. And so this is on top of that 12000 Yeah, this now has nothing to do with updating the model. This is teaching us how to update the model. And when we're going along, because now I have to continue to do projects, we've got to put all that stuff in and we've got to take stuff out. So we need to know how to run this to make sure that we can you know, we're utilizing it to its full extent because it wouldn't make any sense to spend the money on that. So. This was supposed to be included in the original contract. That's what she told us. It was a $43,000 lump sum. Then she's going to help us forever with it, basically. And now it's $12,000 earlier this year, another $14,000. This is really getting expensive. So is he. I'm not the one reaching out to him all the time. That would be you and Teresa. Really? Yeah, I got the emails. Okay, so yes, this is an extra cost, but she is going to teach you guys how to, so that we could be more independent. I want to be independent. I don't want to have to go back and teach them again. Okay. Thoughts? Can we have a motion? I move to reject the proposal. Is there a second? A second? Motion dies. Can we have a motion so we can discuss this? I move because I think we need to discuss it. So. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, discussion. She's also going to produce a manual for the office staff. Is that included in? Yes. Task number two. Okay. That's so right. in okay. section two, scope of services, task number one, project management, communication with the client regarding the project, general project management administrative duties. Task number two, preparing a training booklet for the North Prairie office manager, review existing instructions and current project version titled North Prairie or whatever. Prepare an appropriately detailed step-by-step -step training document for each worksheet. 26 within the project by further developing narrative and screenshots of critical steps for successfully completing and model updates. Task three, engineer-led training, facilitate in-person training for North Prairie Office Manager by utilizing document development in task two. Engineer re recommends two consecutive half-day afternoon for one day morning for second day in-person training sessions. This is in-person training will focus on completing a true up of the year of 2023 and incorporating the year of 2045 budget once developed. Task four, on-call assistance. Engineer will be available for on-call virtual assistance to client following an in-person training session to provide further clarifications, answer additional questions as needed. Three, additional services. Services resulting from significant changes in the general scope extended or the character of the agreement are not included as part of the general scope of the service provided in section two. This is for, I mean, it's as if authorized, you can read that by the client engineer will provide services beyond the scope of this agreement on an hourly basis in accordance with the standard hourly rate schedule, which is exhibit B, which you have in front of you. There are no additional services anticipated as of the agreement except in state. Client shall designate a person to act as a client's representative with respect to the services to be provided under this agreement in a timely manner so as not to delay the services of the engineer. Section five, it shows you the fees. So hypothetically, we approve this. This covers us for the year. Yeah, we're not going to keep going down this road. She's not going to keep doing the work. We're going to do the work. Okay. We just need to make sure that we know how we're doing the work in the program. So it's basically a software training program. Okay. And help us through that. 
And then once she does this, then your staff and you will be able to run with it. Yep. So she doesn't have a manual already made for just general general clients that purchase this? So other people can figure it out? Or everybody else has to pay for their own manual? Wouldn't the manual be tailored to each organization? I don't know if it would well, be. Well, we, we made her simplify her program a little bit because we, it was kind of complicated. And so we changed it somewhat. Right threw it up. I don't know. It is complicated and she simplified it because it says that this doesn't make sense and it's too difficult to work with in some areas. Not all of it. Some of it's really great. But you spent the money. I want to finish it and I want to make it so that we're utilizing this service because this is the map of the future and this does lay it out because it coincides with the 10-year capital improvement plan and as you you know that's a working document that you've got to add and subtract and take things off and sometimes things get done faster than they need to be done sooner I guess than where they are in that 10-year plan and you're always adding on right so um, you have to have a roadmap and you need to keep track of your assets you need to know when they were put in you need to win when they're placed it was a lot it, to develop this and get the right information into to make sure that we had good information in there that it's solid it was a lot of work because yeah. nobody's ever compiled it like that before you know well a lot yeah, of the first know. lines nobody knew exactly you know were, did they this year that year mm -hmm. you know when right. it first went in yeah. So does it make it, an go ahead. does it make it better for continuity down the road? We have different people in different positions, and now we have the Bible, so to speak, or the roadmap to take us where we need to be and, and where we've been before in the past. Is that basically what it's for? So yeah, you gotta, anybody you know, can pick it like, up. It's right. like an SOP. We have SOPs in our office, right? We have an SOP for how to do this task, this task, this task, whatever. This is the same thing. She's going to create an SOP, a standard operating procedure for this program. Thoughts, Tara? This, the monthly invoice, is that like a breakdown of these numbers here and what was getting done every month? On page, oh, top of page three. Okay, and what are you asking? Monthly invoices. Mm -hmm. Is that referring to this total? And it's going to be broke down? She's right here. Monthly invoices will be prepared and sent to the client as set forth in Exhibit A. Exhibit A. this total it would not exceed that and for that we will get one two all these things done for this amount I think the fact that it would give independence right okay. mm -hmm. I didn't want this to go on and on and on forever right right so we have to stand our own two feet. Right. Employees retain, the more experience they have, they retain. So I told her I thought it would be better if she could lay out right. I, I, what it's I, gonna know. Cost. I guess I was, I'm just a little confused because I, I understand we were paying for <coughs> software, right? right? We had that total. And now this is additional for training and everything, correct? So that we can do this on our own, or on your own. So. 
I was confused by the, the monthly invoice. That's why I said, are we going to continue to pay additional additions? I'm assuming that as you move along, she's right. going to send you right. a monthly invoice for okay. that. Uh, the for work that's been done. Okay. When the work is completed, yeah, right. the running total, we can't get above this. Okay. And I also need to explain one more thing. When Sarah did this, when we hired her, this is her program. She built this building. Right. And she works for the engineering form. It's still a program, but it's not the same as one. Okay, let's do a, any other questions? Let's do a roll call vote. All in favor? What's board? the motion on the table? The motion. What's to discuss? We don't, we don't have a motion. We just have this, a motion for discussion. Yeah. We need there is a Wait a minute, you made the motion. I think I made the motion too. She seconded so it discuss. so we could have discussion. Now we're have ready. A motion or a I think I made the motion. You did. Yeah. And Lori said, or so, did you? No, you have it correct that you want a roll call vote on the motion to discuss this. To? No. Because there's, this. there's no motion on that yet. Well, I maybe misunderstood my motion. I I said that I made a motion to, to go ahead with this <coughs> with the idea with that we need to have a discussion. That was my ad lib. Oh, okay, okay. That was my ad lib. I maybe I shouldn't have done that that way, but that's what I meant. Okay. So we can incur discussion about the motion. Great. Okay. Let's do a roll call vote. What, can I clarify something? Yes. I think we should put in there. So I'll put it in there. Not to exceed this amount. You're approving, mm -hmm. but you can exceed this fourteen thousand one fifteen. I think that's how it should read. Okay. Okay. You can't go over this. All right. Roll we'll call vote. Signify by saying aye. Aye. Daryl. Crystal. No. Austin. Aye. Tara. Aye. Okay. Motion passes. Um, now we are, we've been contacted by quite a few members who, um, who want this. We're doing informational meetings and Monty is going to draft a guide that we can follow for these meetings, okay? These are all scheduled except where it says tentative. So basically, we're explaining what the bylaw revisions are. I talked to one of the mayors yesterday and of our, one of our bulk users and I said, you, by passing this bylaw, then next year, we can do mail-in votes if the board agrees to it. Because we're getting, people don't necessarily want to come to these meetings. So it would give the members still their vote and their say if something happened and they couldn't be at that meeting. So he's gonna do a just a printout sheet, which you all will get, and it's just a, meant to be an educational and informative meeting, okay? Crystal. You forgot to put my name on here. No, you can do it to any all of them. You're a member of my team. You're director of my Well, everybody gets one specifically assigned to them, but I didn't get one specifically assigned to me. Because you're at large. Oh, okay. Good question. Um, yeah. On for for Austin, is it City Hall? Which City Hall are we talking about? It's City Hall in Dallas. In, in Dallas? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know they had one. Yep, they do. Okay. Um, there'll be a letter that will go out. Okay. To everyone, you know, have that. This was Kaylee just typed this up quick because sure. we didn't. We don't have those last two. But we we have the date nailed down. They were pretty sure that they had to check there um, just to make sure. Just because your name is only by your area, you still are welcome to go to more. Um, okay, but Monty will get us the sheet that 
you know, as far as educating, and they're not meant to be long. Okay, it's just that members, um, they said that this was something they wanted to see. So, yes, please. Yeah. Please. So, um, we were talking about this uh, before the meeting, and. Um, When, when we we put together the proposed bylaw revisions, um, they do I think three three I think I said this at the last meeting, but for purposes of trying to communicate with the participating members as to what what at least I was thinking about when when we put these changes together is first throughout the bylaws there are stop what I would call style changes that they're not substantive there's some capitalizations and some other things and you see those throughout all the red line version and they're they're just really trying to clean the language up and and um, their style and then then second what what is occurring through these is is um, people don't go to public meetings like they used to and so what we see is that more and more cooperatives and water boards and things they're having a hard time getting people to come to the, to the meeting on the day that the meeting's scheduled and so the idea is to try to broaden that participation by allowing people to participate either in virtual meetings which are probably not there yet they have a virtual meeting with four or five hundred people attending by zoom but, but that technology i think is becoming more prominent but also to allow people to vote by um, electronic mail ballot or by some kind of uh, absentee ballot. And again, the idea behind that is that for director uh, elections and for any kind of resolutions or motions or things that are made that you wanna put in front of the um, participating members that, that somebody could participate even if they couldn't come to the meeting, they could participate by vote. And so that that's part of this. Um, the third thing is um, because people don't participate at these meetings at the same rate that, that they might have in the past, um, the bylaws are, uh, the proposed amendments are designed to, to try to make sure that before the district moves forward with something based on an annual meeting that you have some broad consensus of your participating members. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that Right now, the bylaws don't have a quorum requirement at all, which means if you have an annual meeting and 15 people show up, those 15 people can pretty much put in place, you know, with, with whatever they want. And that maybe that's not a good idea. Maybe that you want to have some kind of minimum quorum, and so we we proposed adding a, a quorum requirement. The the other issue has to do with um, members making motions from the floor at the annual meeting. And, and there's already a limit in the bylaws as to what the members can do from the floor at the annual meeting to kind of to govern the district. But the concern that we've seen in other entities that and, and, and is behind it shows up in these proposed changes is what you don't want to have happen is that you have an annual meeting, you have um, a small turnout, and then somebody makes a motion from the floor that has significant impact on the district. Um, good or bad, right? And, but but nobody knew ahead of time that it was going to be on the district's agenda. Nobody knew ahead of time it was going to be discussed and talked about. You want to get those ahead of time so that everybody, all the members, can know ahead of time what's going to be discussed and what's going to happen. And that, along with allowing people to participate absentee um, through voting, is designed to broaden who can participate in the district affairs and to make sure that that as many of uh, the members as possible are, are involved. So I think those are the, the uh, main things. And then the final thing, which is probably uh, um, the last meeting maybe controversial, uh, is to add to the bylaws the ability for this board to police itself. Right now, you don't have any ability to remove a member if the member is no longer qualified uh, if they become disabled or if um, they've committed some kind of wrongdoing and so for instance if 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 the treasurer of the entity uh, of the district were were embezzling from the district <coughs> you wouldn't have the ability to remove that person that they would have to go to the members and so um, 
um, we, we are recommending and the board has recommended that, that ability. So that generally in a nutshell is what the bylaw revisions would allow if they <coughs> didn't you say um, didn't you say that most boards already have that in place? Yeah, I mean I, I, I think most most uh, most boards um, in the cooperatives that I deal with, the board has the ability, and, and, and when I, I, I keep referring to cooperatives, and the reason I do that is because in the Century Code where the water district is formed, water districts can be uh, political subdivisions, but they can also uh, be um, akin to cooperatives, right? So it's a very much the same model where a cooperative is member governed and member owned and the boards are member governed and somewhat member owned because it's a um, political subdivision of the state. And in our working with cooperatives, cooperative boards have the ability to remove directors. Um, and for instance, the North Dakota legislature has the ability to, to remove members, right? Um, so that is a um, common part of the governance and so that's I mean again that might be controversial the members will have to decide whether they are they're in favor of that or not but certainly that was our recommendation to this board and that's what this board um, included in its recommendations to the members so I mean, that, that's how I think that would be explained okay um, let's move on there is no engineers Mr. Hendrickson wants to ask a question okay uh, is Monty going to be attending these bylaw meetings? Or is it just us? Would you like him to? No. Why? Uh, because he's expensive and he's in Bismarck. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine days. Nine different days of travel and lawyer expenses. It seems a little excessive given that we're talking about how um, our legal bills are getting a little high. Um. We'll see how the first meeting goes, okay, is what I would say. If it's purely educational and informational, um, I, see, I see it being quick. Um, we'll see how it goes. And then another question? And I could probably answer oh. that. I, I'm sure we haven't talked about this, but yeah. I'm in a uh, two-week trial starting Monday. So the, my ability to attend any of these meetings right now, I don't think is, is uh, likely. Yeah. So. Right. And another question. So if I want to add something to the agenda. To what agenda? At the annual meeting. So like, let's say I just want to add something to the agenda. You know how to do that. Email Teresa. And, and then it will be added? Um, it depends, no. The annual meeting agenda is set by the bylaws. Yeah. Oh, okay, so then, so currently, anything that gets added to the agenda is done at the time of the meeting. I have to look at that. I, the, the, the bylaws have an agenda for the annual meeting. I, I'm not old business, new <coughs> business. <coughs> yeah. So, so if I want to introduce something at new business and you want to have this advanced notice, then will you put it on the agenda? I'm, sorry, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. Yeah. Be specific. Well, you said that we need to have advanced notice of what's going to be discussed at the meetings. So, who sets that agenda? And um, yeah, no, the, the or is there like some sort of like is there is there discretion? And who who makes the discretion of what gets added to the agenda and what does not? So, I think we're talking about two different things. Yeah. The, the what I was referencing is in the proposed bylaw amendments is a a proposal to add to the bylaws a requirement that if the members want to bring a resolution to have it decided at the annual meeting that that resolution will be provided in advance so that it can be given to all of the members before the meeting so that all of the members know what's going to happen at the annual meeting and I think that's a different question than how the agenda at the annual meeting is set so so maybe it would be best if I proposed a resolution then to submit it would have to fall within the Third day. I mean, because we have, we would have to send that out, and we have to send that out. Yeah. I mean, I okay. Well, so anyway, I, so I would like to add to the agenda um, my proposed jurisdiction map, which actually I've revised a bit, where it just follows the highway lines. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a proposed um, revised high jurisdiction map. We've already voted and agreed to present to the members the jurisdiction map and lines. 
mean, that is part of Monty's bylaw revisions. But under current bylaws. Yes. Under current bylaws. But you remember I can the still meeting where we passed. Yeah, we agreed to present that as a board recommendation. Yes. But there can still be other options. So I'm going to present a second option. I think you're asking how would a member get something like that on the... Correct. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. So. Wouldn't you need a motion from the board to yes. accept your version to present? So then there's like gatekeepers. So as long, if the board doesn't agree, the members don't have the power or the authority to add anything to the agenda. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Look, the, we, we all have... The, there's roles to follow here and, and procedure that we're all abiding by. If the members don't like that well, map all. that not was all. proposed by the board, yeah. recommended by the board, they don't. They can vote it down. That is. And then the lines stay. Yeah. Or we have another option. Yes. Yeah, I think what you're, Director Henderson. I think what you're asking is how does a member place a matter on the agenda at the annual meeting? And I don't have an answer for you at the on top of my head about how that occurs, right? I think that there's some ability for members at the annual meeting to make motions from the floor, but I have to look at the bylaws and I have to look at Robert's rules to decide that. So I mean, if that's something you want me to look into, I certainly can. I actually don't want you to look at anything because um, I don't, I don't need your opinion on it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, no engineers report. Our May meeting is held here. Yep. Held here Tuesday, May twenty eighth at eleven. And with that, our meeting is adjourned.